Uh, quizzes due today, right? Yes. Is that right? Okay. What? <laughs> what is? What quiz? Uh, so we did we did sort of the basic Newton's laws for ideal systems, and uh, now we're going to get uh, more realistic in this chapter. One of the things what's one of the things we're going to do in this chapter? The main thing, actually. We're going to start to talk about friction. Everyone's familiar with friction. In fact, <coughs> historically, friction was just thought to be fundamental. In the old physics called the Aristotelian, the physics of Aristotle, it was just assumed to be a, um, something that just always existed. If you start something moving, it would come to rest. And as I think I've told you before, Galileo was the one who said, wait a minute. You know, let's forget about friction. Let's just see what we, progress we can make by idealizing the motion. Well, that's what, that's what we've done so far. And, but now we can put, now that we've learned something, some basic mechanics, now we can put friction in. Okay? So, <clears throat> we're going to look at what's called static and kinetic friction here. And let me remind you that um, when we have, let's say, a horizontal plane, and a mass on it in a gravitational field that there is, you know, there's a weight acting downward due to the Earth on this mass. There's an equal and opposite force due to the plane, the surface on this body, and that's called the normal force, right? There can also be a tangential force, <coughs> and that's easy to um, demonstrate. <coughs> Not that I was planning on doing this, but I... Okay. Any questions? <laughs> so what did I do there? I'm pushing this way, right? I'm pushing. You can tell my fingers up. I'm pushing. It's not moving. Well, let's see. If it's not moving, what does that mean? There's got to be an equal and opposite force. That's the frictional force. And in this case, it's called the static frictional force because there's no relative motion of the two of this surface and the surface of the table. It's a static frictional force. Later we'll deal with kinetic frictional force, but right now let's just deal with a static frictional force. Okay, so now I gotta put this back. So how do we um, quantify that? Well, um, the first thing you want to notice here, I shouldn't have taken this off, forget this, ignore the string there, is that when I push very lightly, there's going to be an equal and opposite static frictional force. Pointing, it's going to be pointing this way when I push it. When I push a little harder, what's, what's happened? Yeah, the static frictional force exists in a range of values. If I push, keep pushing harder and harder, eventually it will slip and this will move. Okay, like I said, ignore this right now. So, um, that causes a little bit of a problem. The static frictional force is, is it's, it's a reactive force. Now, I told you we weren't going to talk about reactive force. That Newton's third law me meant that we don't have to talk about action and reaction. Well, this is a case where it really is appropriate to talk about reaction. The static frictional force here is reacting to, what, to our external force. And it can supply magnitudes of, of the force in a range of values, okay? So, but eventually, eventually here, if I exert a hard enough force, it's going to move, right? So, that's when the static frictional force maxes out. It has a maximum value. So that's something that we can quantify. There is going to be a maximum friction force. It's going to depend on the nature of the surfaces. It's also going to depend upon the normal force. The bigger the normal force, the more, you can see that I've got some weights in here, right? If I put more and more weights in there, it's going to be harder and harder to get this thing to move. It's a common experience. So what is found approximately, this is in empirical, and um, as far as I, uh, as far as I know, no one's been able to calculate this. Friction is very hard to deal with from a fundamental point of view. And as far as I know, I don't, um, 
I don't think, we're going to treat this as an empirical or experimental fact. I don't think anybody's derived it. So here's what, here's what it is. The maximum static frictional force, we've got to write a max here because the frictional force exists in a range, is proportional to the normal force. If I double the normal force here, if I add weights to this little box, oh, this is, I'm sorry, I should have showed you, this is a box, right? If I add, if I double the weight of this box, I'm going to find that it takes twice as much force to get this thing to move, all right? So it's proportional to the normal force, and what sits here um, is called the coefficient of static friction, and what are the dimensions of the coefficient of static friction? This is a mu. Greek lowercase mu s. What are the dimensions? Dimensionless. It has to be dimensionless, right? It has no units. So the coefficient of static friction depends upon the nature of the surfaces. Obviously, if this were sandpaper, the tabletop here, instead of whatever it is, whatever this material is, the coefficient of static friction is going to be greater, right? In fact, a lot greater. So it depends upon the the nature of the two surfaces in contact depends upon both surfaces. And ultimately, we would like to have a theory that allows us to calculate what this is in terms of um, properties of the surfaces. And I don't know if anyone's been successful in doing that. If anybody's interested in this, you've, and, you know, you can just go to Wikipedia. It's going to be in Wikipedia, right? It may not be right. It's usually it's right. Usually Wikipedia is right. But it's such a convenience that we all use it, right? <clears throat> um, yeah, if anybody gets interested, let me know. Okay, I didn't, I didn't look it up. But that's the, one of the goals of physics, the primary goal of physics would be, we should be able to calculate this. Now, what, um, uh, let's go to the diagram. So here's something interesting. What if I take this, imagine this, I have a block here, okay? And there's going to be a um, the maximum static. Of, I have to to get this to move. I have to exert this force. What if I take the block and rotate it 90 degrees and set it on it on one of its sides? You'll have less of that friction because you have less surface area. <laughs> you might think that. The weight will still be the same, though. The weight's the same. Yeah, the answer is it takes this, it's the same. And it's, it's in our formula here. It only depends upon the, we're not changing the nature of the surfaces, we're, and we're not changing the normal force. And this was discovered um, before Galileo. This was discovered, believe it or not, by Leonardo da Vinci. You know? They'd, so, um, there's a famous drawing that he made where he has a block, different orientations, and indicating that. It takes the same force to get it moving, which means that, um, <coughs> which is explained by the fact that it just depends upon the normal force. We're not changing the normal force, right? So to get at what Damon was talking about, what's different? When I take a block, when I take this block and I rotate it and, go and, and put it like that, what's different? The, the surface area is different, but what's really important here is the force, is the normal force, and that's not changing. So in a sense, <coughs> yeah, there's a tendency, I think, and, uh, and you're not the only one, that I, I remember thinking this some time, a long time ago, the, the pressure is changing here, right? The force is the same, the normal force is the same, but we're reducing the area, so the pressure goes up. So you can, you know, you can conclude, incorrectly conclude from that, that maybe it takes a greater, what did you conclude, that it took a greater force to move it, if it like, or less? I forgot, I'm, I'm no, for that wouldn't be greater, because there's, there's a greater pressure. Right, That's right. But it's not just the, what's not what's, and it's, it's reasonable too, it's not what's important, it's just the pressure. It's the pressure times the area that's important, which is very reasonable. The pressure is a local thing. If I want to find, you know, the total, the maximum frictional force, it would seem reasonable to multiply the pressure times the area, which is just that. 
Now, um, you can look the coefficient of friction up in tables. They're ta I've done this before. You can look up in tables. Um, I want to give you a warning here uh, that uh, it's stated later in the notes. This coefficient of friction is notoriously uh, uh, not uniform. So even if you have a nice surface, and I had to clean this surface, every time I do this demonstration, I have to get some Clorox or whatever and clean this surface. And you know why? Because when this thing moves along here, it, the, the motion will be different. You'll see it accelerate and decelerate due to non-uniformities in the coefficient of friction. Okay, it's not uniform. It's notoriously true. And also, I want to point out that this is just a model here. If you do a careful experiment, you're going to find, you're going to find deviations from it, okay? And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, specifically. Okay, so here's what we can summarize now, and this is the magnitude of the static frictional force exists in a range. Right now, what's the magnitude of the static frictional force? It's zero, right? Now it's non-zero. It exists in a range. The magnitude can be go down to zero, and it goes up to some maximum value. Uh, and incidentally, we're going to be, in the beginning here, we're discussing horizontal planes. We'll eventually go to an incline plane, okay? But this is still true. The maximum, which is reasonable, the maximum static frictional force, the magnitude, only depends upon the normal force and the coefficient of friction, static friction, yeah? So the reason that the static frictional force is less, they can be less than or equal to is because it does, is that to account for the uh, non-uniformity? No, no, that has, sorry, that has nothing, that, that's, this occurs for a perfectly uniform surface. Okay. Yeah, sorry, yeah, that, that's a, that's a, a detail. The, the, the fact that is a, it's a realistic fact that I'm just, w one of the warnings that you need to know about friction. If you ever get involved and you do calculations, you know, you look this up in a table, that's assuming a perfectly uniform surface. And the surfaces just tend not to be uniform. You have to clean them very carefully. And I worked hard on this, you know, and it's still, you, when we do some demonstrations with this later, you'll see the non-uniformity in here. It's just very, very hard to beat that, and you have to be very careful to get it to come up with a uniform you surface. Spend more money to get better tables. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you know, I think you know this is real. This is reality. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You know. So it's it, again. This is one of these issues that depends upon what well, this came up before. It's Damon or somebody. It depends what you're after. You know what your experiment is, what you're interested in, it may be that you need a highly uniform surface to, do, to get done whatever you want to get done, okay? Here we're dealing with the normal reality case where as you will see, it's typically not uniform. Okay, well that's static friction. If I exert a big enough force, where it's gonna move, right? Then, is there a frictional force? Yeah, but we gotta give it a different name and you'll see why in a moment. But it's naturally called kinetic friction. This is when the two surfaces are in, have relative motion to each other. So if, if they're moving like this, there's no relative motion, right? That's static friction. When there's some relative motion, the frictional force is called the kinetic frictional force. And you'll see in a moment why we have to distinguish these two. It'd be nice if there was just, you know, we didn't have to distinguish, between, but we do, as you'll see. Uh, so here's the idea. <clears throat> if let's say I apply a sufficiently large force um, here, this thing's going to move. And now by Newton's second law, here's my here's my force diagram. Okay, um, I would write in general that the motion here, the acceleration, is dictated by the net force. So here's the net force. I'm choosing right to be the positive direction. The net force, which is the applied force minus the kinetic frictional force, is the mass times the acceleration. Now, the um, experiments show that um, 
this kinetic frictional force behaves similarly as the static frictional force. It's, in particular, it's proportional to the normal force, which is to be expected. You double the normal force, you, you double the uh, kinetic frictional force. And there's a coefficient here, de depends upon the surfaces. So it would be nice if we didn't have to put a subscript on here. But why do we have to put a subscript on? Why do we have mu sub k and mu sub s? You, you all are familiar with this. It's easy, pardon me? I mean, yeah. And the colloquial or com common way of saying it is, it's easier to, to uh, keep something going than to get it going. So if I, and I'm going to demonstrate this for you in a little while, but it's, it's um, I have to exert a certain force here to start this thing moving. Once it's moving, I can back off on that force and keep it moving with a constant velocity. So the, it's always or almost always true that the coefficient of kinetic friction is less than the coefficient, coefficient of static friction. That's the quantitative statement of it's easier to keep something going than to get it moving than to keep than to get it moving from the beginning. It's easier to keep something moving than it is to get it moving from the beginning. And yeah? You said almost always true. I'm trying to think of a, a scenario where that's not going to be true. I'm willing to bet it's out there somewhere. Maybe some exotic material. Look it up. It's going to, probably going to be in Wikipedia. <laughs> right? I just, you know, I just don't have the time. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating, and especially fascinating since I, I don't know the current status of the, of the theory of this. People have tried. I've heard about this. As recently as uh, last decade, I heard, uh, I heard that my professor, the, my PhD advisor, was, got, had gotten interested in it, was working on it. So, yeah, I don't know if there's a microscopic theory of friction. I'm sure people have tried, but I don't know how, I, I don't know how successful they've been. So why am I saying this? What was it, what was you? I've forgotten. Sorry. I was trying to think of a time where yeah. you for kinetic is yeah. more than static. So I'm willing to guess that, that, that there are situations, probably unusual, where it's very close, okay, with a coefficient of kinetic friction, but it's probably not quite equal to. And this is reasonable because what's what's happening in static friction is we've got there's bonding between these the molecules of these. The, uh, um, you know, the molecules in this, the molecules and atoms of this surface <coughs> and this surface. In static friction, there's bonding going on. That's what's responsible for static friction. And it's very reasonable that to break those bonds, it's going to take more force than to keep this moving with constant velocity. Because here the bonds are continually made and broken. That's where the frictions, that's where the kinetic friction is coming from. The bonds are continually being made and broken. Here they're here they're, they're made, okay, and, and you've got to break them all at once. So it's reasonable that mu k is less than mu s. Um, okay. Now again, this is not just for a horizontal surface. It's, it's true. Um, it's true in general. And incidentally, I just realized, you know, we could write we could write mg here, right? That, that were, that's true. N is equal to mg. But the reason people don't write that is they want to be general about this. When we go to an inclined plane, N is, does not equal mg. We've already seen that and we'll see it, I'll remind you, we'll see it again. So this is the general form. You might wonder, you know, why don't you just put in mg? It's because it's not always true, that's why. It's only true for horizontal surface. Okay, so now we can solve the Aristotle problem, you know, objects given a, some initial velocity always come to rest, right? So due to our idealized approach, we, as I mentioned earlier, we neglected, um, we neglected friction, okay? But now we've got it back in there. So now we can do a simple calculation. Let's say we have a two kilogram block on a horizontal surface. We're given the fact that the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.30, and we give it an initial velocity of five meters per second. It's gonna to come to rest. And we can ask, for example, how far does it travel? We can now calculate that. We can predict it, given this knowledge here. 
in this initial condition and the, the, math, the parameters here, we can now calculate it. So how does that work? Well, what comes next? Anybody? Everybody? Yes. There's, here's our picture. Okay, so there it is. It's really simple here. We've got this normal force that's balancing the, the weight, the gravitational force. The motion's in this direction. The kinetic frictional force is always opposite to the motion here, okay? So, it's, so the motion's this way, so it's going to be opposite. And I write down the next step is from the force diagram, we write down Newton's second law. In the vertical direction, we just have the normal force is equal to mg in this case, because it's horizontal. Uh, and now Newton's second law for the motion, the mass times acceleration is the net force. There's just one force here. It's pointing in the opposite direction. I got to put the minus, you know, it's pointing in this direction, so I put a minus sign here. And I can substitute in what the normal force is in this case, and I get that. I simplify, and I get that this is the acceleration. I know these numbers, I plug it in, and oh, by the way, we have constant acceleration because this frictional force is constant. Now, there's another, here's another thing I gotta tell you, and it's in the notes somewhere. Maybe I skipped it. This model here, this is a model. You want to remember that this coefficient of friction stuff is a model. It's, it's just approximately true. What's the velocity dependence? How does the kinetic frictional force depend upon velocity according to our model? This is not a trick question. You guys are all looking like, oh, there's a trick here. <laughs> it doesn't, okay? The model predicts, it, it, the model states that the kinetic frictional force is independent of velocity. That's approximately true, but you can find situations where it's not true. In fact, there's a, now that I think about it, there's a famous one, but uh, I don't think I should get into that. Okay. But if you're interested, just drop by my office. I'd be happy to talk about it. But, so this is just an approximation here, the velocity independence. But typically it's a pretty good approximation, as long as it's not moving too fast. Okay, so we have constant acceleration here, because it's velocity, the frictional force is velocity independent. Although it does depend upon the velocity in the sense that it's opposite the direction of the velocity. Um, we could go to our kinematics, one-dimensional kinematics. Way back there, remember a long time ago? Seems like a long time ago. <laughs> so, um, we're not given any information about time. We don't care about the time, so we think of the no time equation. Here it is. And in our case, this holds for constant acceleration. We know the acceleration. Uh, then we're gonna set the final velocity equal to zero. We're, we wanna know how far it goes and we can, this is the displacement, this is what we're after, but we can set x not equal to zero if you like. We, we're free to do that. And we have one equation and one unknown and we can find the distance that it travels. Now, what if we double the mass? What happens? I double the mass but I keep everything else the same. The coefficient of friction is the same. The initial velocity is the same. Okay, horizontal surface, gravity is the same. What, hap what do you think is going to happen if I double the mass? Nothing Why? Because mass canceled out at the very beginning. Yeah, but what does that mean? Yeah, that's right. It's still, everything's still doing the same velocity, which means you still use the same force to get up there in the first place. Or you use a proportional force to get up there in the first place. Yeah, yeah. You're almost, you're almost there. Everything you said was right, okay? And you can see it mathematically canceling here. Look at this equals that. We, we lost it here, okay? So what's happening here is it's a kind of Galileo's thing. Same thing that happens in free fall in a vacuum is when I double the mass, I'm going to double the kinetic frictional force. But what am I, so that's going to make it tend to come to rest sooner. But what am I also doubling when I double the mass? The inertia. It's harder to stop this thing once I've given it that initial, that constant fixed initial velocity. So the two effects cancel each other. This is what, remember, this is what happens in free fall in a vacuum. If I double the mass, it's harder to accelerate this thing, but the, but the force is greater. So they both cancel. 
You double the inertia, but you've doubled the driving force, they cancel out. So all objects in a vacuum fall with the same acceleration. A similar thing's happening here. All objects with the same, you know, same initial condition, same coefficient of friction, doesn't matter what their mass is. They're gonna come to rest at the same distance. It's harder to get the heavier objects, it's harder to get them to come to rest, but they've got more inertia. Uh, it's harder to get them to come to rest because they have more inertia, but the frictional force is greater. So the two, and we see here that the two effects exactly cancel according to our model. Uh, so here we already talked, I, had, I couldn't wait about this. So it's, it's very common here that it's easier to, I have to exert a greater force to get this to start moving than I have to exert to keep it moving with constant velocity. So that, what that means is the coefficient of kinetic friction is less than the coefficient of static friction. Very common experience. Uh, we already talked about this. Okay, so let's do it. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's do a demonstration. So I'm exerting, here's a, this, this box again, it's got these, um, I've weighted it down just for, is for convenience, making the demonstration, demonstration works better. Okay, so I've got a, kil, a total of a kilogram in the box here. And here, I have a weight hanger with some masses on it, okay? So the force that I'm exerting on the, the box right now is equal to that weight, a tension, you know, just tension force is transmitted here and the tension is just equal to the weight and it's not enough to get it to move, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in 50 gram, this is kind of coarse here, but it's a demo, right? 50 gram increments, otherwise we can be here all day if we try to take data on this. I've added one 50 gram. When I'm doing it, you notice I'm doing this carefully. I don't just throw it on there, right? Why is that? If, if I give this a, if I give it a jerk, I could break the static friction. If I momentarily exert a greater force, I could break it. And then now we got kinetic friction. We, we just want to deal with static friction right now. So what I'm doing is, I'm putting my hand underneath the weight hanger to, to support, backing off on the force, and then putting this down, and then carefully removing my hand, right? So, hasn't broken yet. I'm gonna do the same thing again. And I thought it was supposed to go then, but it didn't. Gosh. Why does, it's always different when you, <laughs> fortunately I have another one down here that I wasn't. It's a bad part of the table. <laughs> okay, we're gonna do this demonstration again. I'm, I'm, I need to change the surface. You know, I tested this uh, 45 minutes ago. Okay? I, don't, I don't get it. This is friction. Welcome to friction. Okay, let's see if this makes a difference. So now, okay. So, what did you see there? Well, we broke the static friction. But there's something else. If you look carefully, I want you to notice something here. Let me go back. Once the static friction braces, breaks, once we break it, how would you describe this motion? So, I'm gonna watch this again. I'm going to do it on three. One, two, three. It's accelerating. It's accelerating. Oh, so what does that mean? I mean, why, did, why is it accelerating? The reason is the coefficient of kinetic friction is less than the coefficient of static friction. Once we break the friction, we found just enough force to break the friction. But now the frictional force all of a sudden drops. And we've got this net force here, so it accelerates. So this is actually visual evidence that the coefficient of kinetic friction is less than the coefficient of static friction. Yeah? Is that kinetic friction? Does that get less and less as the acceleration becomes greater? Okay, now you're asking, well, well you're, you're, you're starting to ask about the velocity dependence, I think. No, it's independent of acceleration, according to our model, right? Once the surfaces are slipping, there's just one constant kinetic frictional force. Does that answer your question? Yes. 
Yeah, okay. According to our model. Okay, well, we're not done with this. Watch this. I'm going to take off. Okay, Most, all of this, this is, what it, this is what it required to get us to break the static friction, right? So I'm going to back off from that a lot, and I have to do it a lot. And now we're going to do another experiment here. So it's just sitting there. Now the, the kinetic frictional force is less. What if I give this a tap? You see that it de I give it some small initial velocity and it comes to rest, right? Now I add 50 grams. Oh, went a little farther. You notice that? Because I'm increasing the driving force. You see the non uniform You see how it's accelerating? These? That's non uniformity. Uh, uh, once it comes to rest, those bonds, it's static friction now. So I think we need to add one more to get to the point here. And the point is, I've got, I'm applying less force than before to break it, but it moves with constant velocity. So before we had to put this on here to break the static frictional force. Now to keep it moving, it takes less force. It's easier to keep something moving than to get it going moving. This is just, that's what we're showing here. And the technical statement is the coefficient of kinetic friction is less than the coefficient of static friction. It's amazing what you can do with, with a, you know, a box and some weights, right? That's the idea of physics demonstrations. We're going to skip this, okay? I, I've always, uh, this is not, I don't think this is in the book, and it's just, it, you can take one look at it, and I think it probably just turns you off. It's true, but we're just going to go straight to an example, a quantitative example. And if, and if, you have any, if you're interested in this, you can look at it, but of course. But um, I think it's best to skip it. All right, so we got a whole page here. We're going to go through, it takes a whole page to, to do this problem here. And there are different aspects to this problem, as you'll see. So we're going to stick with a horizontal surface for now. And we've got a certain mass here, two kilograms. We're applying, a, there's an applied force. And we're given the fact that the, the, we know the coefficient of static friction and the coefficient of kinetic friction. They're substantially different here, which is typically the case, as you saw there. Right? To, the weight I have on there is to keep it moving at a constant velocity. I have to, have, have to add this 200 grams to break, break the static friction. Okay, so the applied, we're going to go, we're going to, we want to know what happens with three different applied forces in turn. One Newton, six Newtons, and ten Newtons. And it starts from rest. So this looks a little complicated. So you, in problems that are complicated, you just do what you can, whatever seems reasonable. What seems reasonable here is calculating the maximum static frictional force. And once I've said that, you know, oh yeah, that's going to tell us. We're going to be able to answer part of the question, part of the problem. We're going to get at part of the problem here and answer it. So the maximum static frictional force is the coefficient of static friction times the normal force, which in normal force is mg in this case for a horizontal plane. We know all these numbers, we can calculate them, we get 7.8 newtons. Okay, so if it starts from rest and I apply one newton, what happens? And I apply it carefully. I don't jerk it on there. If I momentarily jerk on there with a greater force, I could break the static friction. So it's not going to move, is it? What about six newtons? Not going to move. Ten newtons, it will move. It'll it'll be similar to what we saw there. Now, once we've broken the static frictional force for the ten newtons, 
Now the kinetic frictional force comes into play. And our equation of motion is going to be the mass, Newton's second law will be the mass times acceleration is the net force, which is now the applied force minus the kinetic frictional force. All right, I can solve for the acceleration here and I get 2.6 meters per second squared. So there's positive acceleration here because the applied force exceeds the kinetic frictional force, so it'll accelerate in the positive direction. Okay, so that, this so far is not bad. This is pretty simple, right? Okay, now it's going to get a little bit more interesting. What if we apply the six Newton force? It's initially at rest, we apply six Newtons, and then we give it a little tap, like you saw me doing here, right? Now what's going to happen? So we, I give it a little tap, a little initial velocity, now all of a sudden it's the kinetic frictional force that's, that's important. So, what is the kinetic frictional force here? It's mu k times n, it's 4.9 newtons. So, if I'm applying 6 newtons, and it's not moving because it doesn't exceed the static frictional force, and I give it a little tap, what's going to happen? It's going to accelerate in a positive direction. And we can calculate the acceleration. It's 6 newtons minus 4.9 newtons divided by the mass, so it has that acceleration. What if we apply 1 newton? And if it's at rest initially, it's not going to move. We already knew that. But I give it a little tap. What's going to happen? Don't look at this. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, that's, that's your gut reaction, but what's the right answer? Remember, what's the kinetic frictional force? It's right here, right? So I've given it a tap. It's got some initial velocity. I'm driving it with one newton. I've got 4.9 newtons going that way, so what's it going to do? It's going to have negative acceleration, yeah. And physics authors love to, to, you know, love to not use the word decelerate. And I don't know why, this goes way back. But I don't see what the problem is, okay? I don't know why they're so concerned over this. We can use the word decelerate. We know, we know what it means, right? So it's going to technically, it's going to have negative acceleration, or that being our positive direction. So we can calculate that negative acceleration. Okay, so again, I'm applying one Newton. Um, I, give it a t I give it some initial velocity. It could be a tiny or it could be big, it doesn't matter. It's going to have a constant deceleration. And we can calculate it. It comes, it's again, it's Newton's laws. It's just now we've got 1 and 4.9. It's going to be, and it gives us the minus sign. Okay. So if you want to take this one step further, you can try to fathom this graph here. <laughs> But that's, that's basically what's the, the basic idea behind the graph. I just don't know if the graph is worthwhile. I think it may cause more harm than good. Uh, anybody have any questions? Okay. So now, let's get away from this horizontal plane. Let's go to a... Oh, incidentally, this ap applies for curved surfaces, too. Uh, some kind of roller coaster kind of thing or whatever. If I've got some mass moving on this curved surface right here, at this instant of time, there's going to be a normal force here, right? And our model still holds. So you can have a continuously varying normal force. What we're going to do is take the next step from a horizontal surface, planar surface, and go to an inclined plane. That's what we're going to do now. So, um, it's easy to demonstrate. Why is it not moving? There's a driving force here, mg times the sine of the angle. It's not enough to break the static frictional force, but what has to happen eventually? It's got to break. And there are actually two reasons why it breaks. 
as I increase the angle, what am I doing to the driving component here? What's the, what's the, the driving force right now? Zero. I'm increasing it, aren't I? Because it's mg, you know, cosine times the angle here, this angle right here. So I'm increasing the driving force, but I'm doing something, something else is ha automatically happening. Who said that? Yeah, the normal, what's happening to the normal force? It's getting less and less. In fact, here, the normal force is zero. Remember that? We've seen that before. Okay. So there's actually two reasons why it's going to eventually break. And somewhere here at some angle, <laughs> it breaks. All right? Okay, well, what we can do here is we can, we've been calculating the motion giving some initial, given some initial setup, initial conditions, right? We can look at this from a different, from an experimentalist perspective here. By measuring this angle, what information can we get? The angle at which it just slips. What do you think is going to happen here? We can determine the coefficient of static friction. So that's the point of this problem right here. That's one of the points here. So right at slipping, the frictional force will be maxed out. This diagram, and I'm going to write it here, OK? I want to I, I'm make sure you understand this here. This theta sub max is going to be equal to the angle just at which slipping occurs, okay? Just barely starts to occur or barely occurs. In that case, the frictional force will be maxed out. It'll be mu times the normal force. So it doesn't hold in general, but this holds at slipping. So we have, we do our force diagram here, right? Opposite the motion. Just, just, pr just prior to slipping, this is maxed out. The driving force here is mg times the sine of the angle. That's the, um, we take the weight and resolve it into two components because the motion is, when we naturally choose, these vectors are in pure components, right, if we call this the y direction. So we're naturally calling the x direction to be this direction, the y direction to be this direction. We have to resolve the weight into two components. We've seen this before, I'm just reminding you. And here's our driving component of the weight right here. And right at slipping, what's got to be true here? N has to equal mg cosine theta always, because there's no acceleration in this direction. But what happens right at slipping? What's the relationship between these forces? They, they're equal. There's, there's net force is zero. The slightest little increase in angle here makes this force greater. It's going to break the static friction. So we can write down Newton's second law for this um, equilibrium situation here. The normal force is balanced by this component of the weight, and these two forces are equal. And now do you see what we can do here? We have two equations. We don't know the two equations and two unknowns, the normal force and theta max. We can just take this expression and substitute it into here, and we can solve for the coefficient of static friction. And it's independent of the mass, as we discussed before. It cancels out. So this is a way of experimentally determining the coefficient of static friction. You measure that theta max, and you can you just take the tangent of it. Okay, any questions so far? So that's simple. Now, let's take this one step further. Once it starts to move, what's what is the motion going to look like? You tell me what's going to happen. Once it's going to accelerate, right? And why does it accelerate? Because the kinetic friction. All of a sudden, once it starts to move, now the coefficient of friction here it's kinetic. It's dropped. So now we have an imbalance, a, de a definite imbalance of force. So it's going to accelerate down the plane. We saw that before. So what? What, what can we do? Uh, what can we do with that? Well, maybe this is not so obvious, but we can do this. We can start here, and instead of slowly, carefully lifting this in the static situation, we can give it a push. Okay. Well, not quite. I'm going to incline a little more. What am I looking for here? Constant velo right, constant velocity. Pretty good. So, 
What is this the same angle as before? That's a different angle because we have a different coefficient of friction. But by measuring this angle, what do you think we can determine? Just take a wild guess. The coefficient of kinetic friction. So before, starting from rest, we found that by measuring this angle here, wherever it is, it's out here somewhere, we're getting close, it's somewhere. By measuring that angle, we find the coefficient of static friction. By measuring the angle for which the driving force balances the kinetic frictional force, moving constant, oh, there's that non-uniformity, you see? We can now find the kinetic frictional force. And the theory is essentially the same. You can, you can go through the theory, you're gonna find it's, all we have to do is change the mu s to a mu k here. And of course it's a different angle, we call this a critical, it's natural to call this a critical angle. That's not what they called it, um, you know, a few hundred years ago or even, even last century. They called it the angle of repose. Okay, it's poetic 1700s, 1800s kind of stuff. We don't, we don't, you know, if we want that, we'll just watch some movie, period movie they call it, right? So we call, it's natural to call this the critical angle. Why do we use the word critical here? What's so critical about this angle? This is the angle at which <coughs> it moves with constant velocity. And from that, by measuring that angle, we can determine the coefficient of kinetic friction. Why is it critical? What happens, so where, first of all, where's the angle? It's right around, it's right about there, right about there. If I go less than the critical angle, what happens? Comes to rest, decelerates, yeah. And if I go greater than the critical angle, you can see that it accelerates. So it corresponds to a, it's a critical situation. We have different behavior for values above and below. So um, people use the word often critical when, for situations like that. For example, the climate of the planet, right? There are critical values for something. If the temperature, if the average temperature goes above some critical value, drastic things can happen, okay? And people are calculating this and trying to understand it. All right, so those are critical values where the system responds in a very different way. In our case here, it's um, below the critical angle, it comes to rest if I give it initial, give it initial velocity. Above, it, excel it has positive acceleration, so that's a critical value. Uh, let me see if there's the yeah, angle of repose. Yeah, I, I think you're supposed to imagine someone reclining on this. I, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't get it. It's, it's. You can look it up on Wikipedia if you want. See, what, maybe they have some comments on it. Pardon me. Don't do that. Okay, so does anybody have any uh, questions? I want to point out that we actually finished early today. Not that that makes up for all the times that we were late, but it helps. Okay, anybody have any problems or questions?